so speak ye, and so do, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. All right, John chapter 13, as we continue. Now, considering this, that everything that we've seen in the book of John up to this point was over three years, and Jesus' ministry here is coming to an end. This is, we begin chapter 13, this is the day before his last day, right? His last day on earth, he was crucified, and here it is, his last day. And a lot of us, if I said, hey, what would you do if I told you that tomorrow's your last day, and then after that you'll die? What did Jesus do? Well, he had a, a, a dinner with his closest friends, didn't he? He had a, the Last Supper, as it's often called, we see in this chapter. Notice in chapter 13, verse number 1, it says, Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own, which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. This is so important. Jesus here for three years said, My hour is not yet come. Isn't that how he started? Wasn't that John chapter 2 when, uh, his, when his mother was cut, Mary was cut, hey, we need help. And he's like, my hour's not yet come, right? Isn't that, even when we just see it a few chapters ago, Jesus is saying, my hour is not yet come. But now he says, the hour is come. My time is come. This is the day. It's coming. The end of my life is here. My purpose on earth. I was sent into the world to die for the sins of the world. And I'm going to, uh, you know, as we see in Hebrews, he took his, the, the blood to the atonement seat. He was going to reconcile all things. So that was part of it. Notice he says here, though, at the end of verse 1, uh, he says, Having loved his own, which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. He loved them unto the end. I mean, Jesus, as He's going to the cross, He's doing it for the very souls that He's dying for. He's loving them and understanding that He's about to lay His life down for them. This is such a huge thing. This is so important. And I, I do want to make a little bit of a, of a compare and a, a contrast tonight between Jesus... And Judas. And you say, well, that's no comparison at all. I know which side I'm on. I know which team I'm on. Amen. I should hope so. But this is interesting because Judas was his disciple for this tenure. I mean, he saw the miracles. He I witnessed all these amazing things, things that no man could explain. He saw the Jews and the Pharisees coming to him, having faith and believing the miracles, Lazarus risen from the dead. Judas was there. Judas was there all along. Judas was known as a traitor. He's called a traitor. He's known as the one who betrayed Jesus. He's called a devil in John chapter 6, verse 70. Uh, uh, there you go. There's one a good description of him. A devil. Judas was called a devil by Jesus. He knew who would betray him. And he said he was a devil. He didn't just say he had a devil. He said he was a devil. What a characteristic that this man uh, was filled with the devil's spirit in his life. Well, Jesus, obviously, we know, was not the devil. Uh, Jesus was God, in fact. Jesus wasn't just a good spirit. Jesus was God himself, our very creator. Colossians 1.16, right? Galatians chapter 3, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 8. We know that Jesus was our creator. This is so important. So Jesus as God, we have Judas as the devil. So these guys, I mean, talk about a, a juxtaposition. Talk about being diametrically opposed. And yet, right here, this man was with this man the whole time. The devil had his inside guy the whole time working uh, against Jesus' ministry while on the earth. Look at verse number 2 here. And supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. You say, what in the world could have taken place? How, how could that have worked? What events took place uh, in the process of the devil getting into this guy's heart? I would like to believe that, you know, I, I, that maybe Judas was uh, curious to begin with and his intentions might have been pure, but his greed, his pride, his whatever it was, you know, overcame him. I want to show you some of the steps of how uh, Judas became a devil, how his heart became hardened against the Lord Jesus Christ, even as he, he was an eyewitness of these things. He went there 
when, you know, when Jesus sent the disciples with great powers to cast out devils, to heal the... Judas was there. This guy was there. He was there for three and a half years. Uh, I want you to see a few of the steps, how this began to happen, how it happened. If you would, go to back one chapter. Go to John chapter 12. Go to John chapter 12. And if you would, look at... Uh, well, let's look at verses 3 through 6. It says, John chapter 12, verse number 3. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Then saith one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot. I love John. It identifies things we don't see in other ones. So here he's saying, this is Judas, Simon's son, which should betray him. So this is what Judas said. Verse 5. Why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? Can you imagine this man coming to God? Seeing, he literally just brought Lazarus back from the dead. And they're at a meal with Lazarus and his sister is just weeping and washing his feet to show adoration. And he says, why wasn't this sold? We could have gotten money for this oil and she's just wasting it on your feet. What a heart. And I believe the first step, the first problem with him was greed. The first issue began with greed. Again, verse 5, he says, Why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? This he said not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bear that was put in. Of course, Jesus said, let her alone, right? I want to show you a parallel to some of this, or what we're reading now. Go to uh, Matthew 26. Go to Matthew 26. We're going to jump around a little bit for just a second. I want to give you this backstory on Judas. You understand what happened at the end as Judas, all of a sudden, maybe out of nowhere, but Jesus knew he had a devil. He, he saw that early on, several chapters back. But Jesus begins, uh, he, he's giving us these indicators of what happened to him. And I, I believe the first was greed and this is something that as christians we have to be careful of we have to make sure that we don't covet physical things that we don't covet other people that we don't have a desire for great wealth and listen there are plenty of millionaires in the bible and thank god for that and we're kind of in this position where I, but but i have to provide i mean i have to be a good steward and i have to work real hard and I, this takes a lot of work but yet so i need more money to take care of my family and yet it's not all about money i can't lose my focus on god and just focus on the money. So that's a balancing act. Every Christian, especially every Christian man that's doing it right, that's providing for his family, that gets up and goes to work like he ought to, he has to balance this out because our loyalty is with God. And God doesn't want us to be greedy. What's he saying? Was it Psalm, uh, what is it, 50, where he says he owns the cattle on a thousand hills? Right? I, I own all the cattle that there is. If God wanted to tomorrow... Some stranger could leave you a deed and you'd be like, I own a million cows? What's that mean? <laughs> what do I do with a million cows? Well, I don't know. If God decides to give you a million cows, he could. Uh, but then all of a sudden you would be a millionaire, as Abraham was, or as uh, many other, as Job was, many other righteous men. So not all millionaires are bad. Not Being rich is not bad. The problem is the greed. And that's what happens to many. That's how the devil stops a lot of Christians from doing well. It's the love of money that is the root of all evil. And guess what? The devil got a foothold with Judas through his greed. You're in Matthew 26. Look at verse number 20. Look at verse number 7. There came unto him a woman having an alabaster box of precious ointment and poured it on his head as he sat at meat. But when his disciples saw it, they had indignation, saying, To what purpose is this waste? For this ointment might have been sold for much and given to the poor. When Jesus understood it. He said unto them, Why trouble ye the woman? For she hath wrought a good work on me, for ye have the poor always with you, but me ye have not always with you. For in that she hath poured out this ointment. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm in verse, yeah, I'm in 26, I'm sorry. He hath poured out this ointment on my body, did it for my burial. So again, Jesus forecasting what he would do, prophesying, verse 13. Verily I say unto you, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached in the whole world, there shall also this that this woman hath done be told for a memorial of her. He says, listen, and here we have it as an account. Matthew 28, the famous Great Commission, just a few chapters away. Look at verse 14. This is important. This goes to the character of Judas. Then one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went unto the chief priest. So it was immediately after 
this. Now, again, there are things happening in the timeline that we only get by looking on, at multiple chapters. So, uh, he gets in, he has indignation, it said in verse 8. He's angry that God rebuked him. What do you mean? What, what are you worried about? Don't, don't worry about her. Don't worry about the money. She did it for my burial, it says. So, verse 14, then one of the twelve called Judas Iscariot went unto the chief priests and said unto them, What will you give me? And I will deliver him unto you. And they covenanted with him for thirty pieces of silver. And from that time he sought opportunity to betray him. What happened here? He got greedy. He got greedy. I wanted the 300 pence. You know what I'll do? I'll go get 30 pieces. If you won't let me have the 300 pence, I'll get 30 pieces. Right? And listen, Christian, here's the warning to you. Don't get greedy. If you would, go to Luke 22. Go to Luke chapter 22. This is a big problem we have. It is our human nature to desire things. It's our human nature to uh, covet and lust after things that don't belong to us. And it is a huge stumbling block to your spiritual walk. It will slow you down as a Christian. Too many times we get worried about the grass is greener on the other side of the fence. Or it's like, well, what are they doing? How do they get that? Why do they have that? How come they get that blessing? I wanted that blessing. What's wrong? And you, know, and you start to judge unrighteous judgments. You're judging by appearance. And this is a huge stumbling block that the devil will use to get in your life, and that is greed. The next one, I want you to see this. Again, it's still a parallel here. In Luke 22, uh, it's verse 24. He says, And there was also a strife among them, which of them should be accounted the greatest. Now hold on a minute. This is pride. I want you to think about this. Uh-oh, I lost my marker. Look at this. Pride. I hope I don't run out of room here. I only got 14, 15 more points. Just kidding, Brother Luke. Pride. We know that the devil loves to use pride. Isn't that what the devil caused the devil to fall? He was high and lifted up. He's a covering cherub, it said. You know, he was over God's train. You know, well, what happened when Isaiah saw him? He wasn't there anymore, was he? You know, God used him to show glory, and he said, hey, look, look at me, I'm, I'm up here, right? Uh, pride is used to get in your mind to make you think you're better than you really are. We're going to see this in a minute in Peter also. Uh, while we're in Luke 22, though, I want to take a step back, look at this in context. Uh, let's look at verse number 19. And he took bread and gave thanks and break it and said unto them, This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. This is the Last Supper, the very chapter we're reading in Luke uh, or Mark or uh, John 13. Help me out. John 13, right? Likewise, also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood which is shed for you. But behold, the hand of him that betrayeth me is with me on the table. Judas was there. And truly the Son of Man goeth as it was determined, but woe unto that man by whom he is betrayed. They began to acquire among themselves which of them it was that should do this. Now we're going to see this parallel in just a second in John. So they're literally... Jesus makes this statement. It's almost word for word what we see in John 13. We'll see it shortly. He says, the, He's here at the table. The one that's going to betray me is here. They start, Is it me? Is it I, Lord? Is it I? Right? They start asking among themselves. But then look at human nature. Because this same debate happens several times where the disciples argued who should be the, the greatest. Do you remember that? There's been a couple different times where we see that. Oh, we should be the. Now think about the pride that's involved in that. Think about the pride that's involved in that. What's he say? He says, uh, verse 24, And there was also a strife among them, which of them should be accounted the greatest. And he said unto them, The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them. They that exercise authority upon them are called benefactors. But ye shall not be so. But he that is the greatest among you, let him be as the younger. And he that is the chief, as he that doth serve. Jesus is about to uh, exemplify this to them when he goes to wash their feet. And he's saying, listen, the master should serve. That's what he's teaching. Verse 27. For whether is greater, he that sitteth at meat or he that serveth, is not he that sitteth at meat, but I am among you as he that serveth. Jesus said, I am your master and Lord, and I'm going to serve you. 
That's why I came here, was to serve you. But pride gets in the way of that. Pride called, calls Judas to get lifted up, Peter to get lifted up, and obviously other disciples. They're debating over, when we get to heaven, I think I'll be one of the 24 elders. I think I'll be the one. I should be at, at His right hand when we get... Have you seen everything I did for Jesus while we were here? Surely I deserve to be at His right hand. Can you imagine this conversation? As Jesus is about to gird Himself, wash their feet, He's trying to tell them to remain lowly and humble. I am among you, verse 27, as he that serveth. Ye are they which have continued with me in my temptations. And I appoint unto you a kingdom as my Father hath appointed unto me. Hey, there's one coming, right? That ye may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. Thank God he had faith. I believe Simon was saved here. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. What's happening here? They're arguing over who's the best. And somehow the devil is after uh, Judas, which he got successful here. He got him lifted up with pride, but he's also after Peter at this same time. Go back to John 13. Go back to John chapter 13. So consider this as we read what this account with Jesus and Judas. And the effect. I also remember he said that there was indignation. I want you to see this. Verse uh, 13. Verse number 2. And supper being ended, the devil now, having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. What's he putting in his heart? He's beginning to hate. He's beginning to hate. Can you imagine this? And Christian, listen, don't let hate overcome you. We're supposed to overcome evil with good. We don't overcome evil with hate. That won't work. This is what was happening to Simon, uh, Judas, uh, Simon's son, rather. In fact, um, in this chapter, look at verse 26. Uh, Jesus answered, He it is to whom I shall give a sop. And when I have dipped it, and he had dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the, si uh, the son of Simon. And after the sop, Satan entered into him, then said Jesus unto him, Now that doest quickly. What's he saying? They're asking, Who is it? And Jesus says, Whoever I give this piece of bread to, he gives it to Judas. Ugh. Can you imagine? He's like outing him. Most, most of the disciples still didn't catch it. Look at verse 30. He then, having received the sop, went immediately out. And it was night. He, uh, he's angry. He's hateful. He's bitter against God, the God that died for him, that saved him. And here are the characteristics. Judas was the devil. He was full of greed. He was proud. He was full of hatred. That hatred, that envy, that bitterness, ultimately ultimately destroyed him. Now Jesus, on the other hand, and what he's trying to teach here to his disciples is the opposite of the fruit that we see of, Jesus, of Judas. Uh, let's continue, verse number 3. Jesus, knowing that the Father hath given all things into his hands, and that he was come from God and went to God. Remember, Jesus is God. Jesus is God's Son. He sent his Son into the world to die for the sins of the world. And without Him, you're yet in your sin. You will die in your sin. And that's unfortunately what happened to Judas. And uh, actually, while we're here, look at verse uh, 30. What is it? 31. Therefore, He was gone out. Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in Him. Now listen, Son of Man. Man, He's dealing with His flesh, the mankind. Listen, uh, Jesus was brought forth from the Father. But Jesus was never created. Jesus existed as God the Son, if you will. He says, now is the Son of Man glorified, but God is glorified in Him. If God be glorified in Him, God shall also glorify Him in Himself and shall straightway glorify Him. Jesus, again, chapter after chapter in John, He's proving that He is the Son of God and that faith alone on the Son of God will save and many rejected Him. But the, so the characteristics of God, of Jesus, what he's trying to pass on to the disciples are the exact opposite of what we see. So in John 13, look at verse 4. He said he had all things, right? In 3, verse 4, he riseth from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. Now, this takes humility. 
This takes humility. I considered doing this as a demonstration and bringing out a towel and washing the feet of a man here, but I don't want to cause any confusion. This is not an ordinance. We do not see this anywhere else in the Bible. In Acts, they don't do it. In Corinthians, they don't do it. In Romans, they don't do it. I know that there are certain sects that do this, like the Mennonites will do this often, or some of the Amish will, uh, the Brethren will. Uh, but what they're doing, uh, they have a false gospel, mind you. They, they teach that works must be present for salvation. Um, they have uh, more ordinances than we see in the Bible. The Bible teaches us just the two. Keeping the Lord's Supper, purging your heart before the Lord yearly, and then also... Um, having or that you are the um, uh, and baptism of the believer. You have to be a believer to be baptized. So that's an important distinction. So Jesus puts a towel around himself. This demonstrates that he's humble. Now he just said that he has all things, right? Uh, verse 5, After that he poured water in a basin and began to wash the, dis the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Uh, I want you to see that Jesus, as God, came for one purpose. He says in Mark that he came in the form of a servant. You know, a servant doesn't own any possessions. Jesus had no certain dwelling place. How is it that a man that doesn't have a house that he goes to every night fed more people in three and a half years, consider it, than the kings have fed in their entire life? What an amazing thing. Everything that Jesus did was here to serve mankind, to demonstrate the love of God, to show His compassion. He had great compassion on people. He wasn't full of greed. He had an attitude of service. Yep. I want you guys to understand this, that we serve God. This is your job. Everyone, you say, what's my purpose in life? Well, it is to serve God. And you can simplify it and say, and that's it. Well, how do I serve God? I I don't see God. He doesn't knock at my door in the morning and say, hey, Adam, here's what I need you to do today. No. So how do I serve God? Obviously, there is service through worship and reading and studying and preaching the gospel. But how do I serve God? Well, I, I believe the most important thing for a Christian and what Jesus is about to demonstrate here is we serve God by serving others. I can't see God today, but I can sure see you. I can see you. I can see you. So how can I please God by serving you on God's behalf. This is the, the nature of the word ministry. Minister. That's not a title of a person that's above people. That's the person that comes and helps those that are in need, is it not? We're called to minister to the needs and the wants of other people. Jesus came in the form of a servant, and yet He was the very God that created us. He created your soul. He died for the sins. I mean, what, what an act of love that we're going to see here. So, he was not full of greed. He had an attitude of service. Instead of greed, he was sharing. Anything that people gave to Jesus, what did he do? He probably gave it to somebody else. He recognized, um, I can't take this with me. <laughs> They're not going to let me wear a backpack on the cross, so I'm not going to keep the silver and the gold and the food, right? Like that old saying, you, there's, they, don't, they don't put a U-Haul trailer after a hearse. Everybody wants to collect stuff, but what's it say in Ecclesiastes? You're going to leave it to somebody else. Yeah. They're not going to appreciate you. So with our time and talents and treasure while we're here, let's serve God. Let's serve others. Let's share what God has given us. He's also, he's also very humble, and that's what he's going to demonstrate here as washing the disciples' feet. He says in verse 5, He began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Again, this is not something we typically do. Um, we don't walk everywhere on dirty, muddy roads. So we don't have dirty feet. This was a custom that was necessary. Um, every house probably had a washing station. You see where Jesus' feet, the example that was given a couple times of people washing His feet because they were serving the Master. And now the Master says, okay, I'm going to teach you guys a lesson that you need to keep for the rest of your ministry. I'm going to serve you. The Master will get down on His knees and serve the servant. Verse 6. Then cometh to Simon Peter. So he's washing the guy's feet. He gets to Simon. Then comes to Simon Peter, and Peter saith unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Now hold on a minute. Now see, this is the problem. Here's human nature. Here is where a little bit of pride was beginning to affect Peter also. 
Lord, you can't wash my feet. Now, hold on. He's God. He's in charge. Let Him do what He wants to do. Oftentimes, in the Christian life, somebody wants to be a blessing to us, and we won't let them. Now, answer me this, man. Is it more blessed to give a blessing, or is it more blessed to receive a blessing? To give. Listen, and this isn't just saying, I give because I'll get a bigger blessing back. That's not what that verse means. This means that you will have true joy, true happiness, true contentment when you finally figure out that the things here don't matter, that when you're so busy, you don't have time to help somebody else, and if you would just stop and reevaluate, look for an opportunity to serve someone else. Not be greedy, but to share what you already have. To be humble. There's a blessing in this. Peter didn't learn this lesson yet. Peter struggled. I, I love Peter's zeal. I love his fire. And yet, you know, I need to study Peter and say, let me find his mistakes and make sure I don't follow in them. He was a, he was a roller coaster, wasn't he? Look what he says in verse 7. Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not. He says, you don't understand this. But thou shalt know hereafter. But you'll know in a minute. Peter said unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Jesus, look, Peter, if I'm not washing you, then you have nothing to do with me. Now Peter gets it. Whoa, hey, oh, Lord, I need you to wash me. I trust you. I believe in you, right? Peter, Simon Peter saith unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Now here's the zeal. No, no, no. Oh, okay, all right. Yeah, just do everything here. While you're at it, get my back. You know, just scrub my, no, all right, Peter still it doesn't quite get it all. So Jesus gives him a better understanding. Jesus saith unto him, He that is washed needeth not to save wash his feet, but is clean every whit, and ye are clean, but not all. Now this verse is very interesting, and I, I don't want to go too deep into uh, symbolism uh, without a clear interpretation, because Jesus tells us the purpose of this here in a minute. Uh, but, you know, if you think of, what, what is our, our feet shod with the preparation of what? The gospel. Now, this is interesting. This is the most important aspect. I believe when he's talking about washing his feet here, he's giving an example of salvation. I believe that the illustration here is of salvation. The act that Jesus is doing is to demonstrate humility and service. Uh, while you're, well, real quick in verse 10 again, he says, He that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit. <coughs> And ye are clean, but not all. Listen, verse 11 says, For he knew who should betray him, therefore he said, Ye are not all clean. I believe he's saying you're not all saved, because Judas was still here. He literally washed Judas's feet and Peter's feet in the same event here. So when I believe in verse 10, when he says he is washed, is clean, he's talking about salvation. Hold your finger here. Uh, flip ahead to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. I believe it's in uh, where it's in uh, Revelation one. He uses a similar phrase. While you're going to Revelation or First uh, Corinthians six, in Revelation one, verse five, he says, um, "Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood." You're in First Corinthians chapter six, verse number eleven. Look at verse number eleven. And such were some of you, but ye are washed, ye are sanctified. But ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. What an amazing thing here. What an amazing distinction. I believe that when, he, when he's talking, when Jesus is talking about your feet are washed, but not all of you. You're not all clean. He's saying, hey, I may have washed his feet, but he's not clean because he's a betrayer. He's a devil. He's unsaved. I believe it's a salvation issue that he's really getting at. In verse 11 again, in 1 Corinthians 7, it says, and such were some of you, but ye are washed. You're washed from your sins. Ye are sanctified. You're set apart through the Holy Spirit. You are justified in the name of our Lord Jesus. You're justified from your sin just as if you had never sinned by the power of His blood. Go back to John chapter 13. John chapter 13. Jesus came to serve. did it through humility. Jesus was very, very humble. Verse 11, So after He had washed their feet, He had taken His garments and was set down again. He said unto them, 
Know ye what I have done unto you? He said, you understand how I've served you here? Ye call me Master and Lord, and ye say well, for so I am. If then, I'm sorry, if I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. Jesus is trying to say, listen, I have served you. I have humbled myself to help you. You should have the same attitude. Now remember, this is the same dinner event that we read in uh, Luke 22, verse 24, where they argued amongst themselves who would be the greatest in the kingdom. The same continuing argument they had in other places in the Bible. And here Jesus is saying, trying to show them, listen, stop trying to argue who's going to be better in heaven. Why don't you start focusing on seeing who's going to be more humble here? You know, sometimes we, for years I prayed for wisdom and humility. And, you know, humility is something that really is the characteristic of seeing who God really is. When you see who God is, you will humble yourself. And humility is the reaction or the result of you seeing who you really are through the Scriptures. When you understand how wretched of a sinner you are, and that you need a Savior, and you understand how, how loving and beautiful what He did for you is, when you, when you put these things in the right perspective, humility is the result. False humility is when somebody, well, I try not to brag. You know, and you know, we've all had, we've all probably been guilty of it, but we can all recognize it typically when somebody has a false sense of humility. True humility will never be known. Those prophets that their name didn't make it in the Scriptures. These men that ministered in ways and we don't even know their name. How humble is that? Even John will see it in this chapter. He, he names himself, but not by name. He does it as by the disciple that Jesus loved. Humility ought to be the result when we look at who we are. When we look at who God is. The result is that we should humble ourselves. And then what do we do? We serve one another. We serve God by serving one another. Verse 14 again, he said, If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done unto you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent is greater than he that sent him. He says, you want to be my disciple. You want to be a Christian. You want to be a little Christ. You want to follow after me in all your footsteps. You want, you want the world to know that you follow Christ. Well, what did your master do? He got on his knees. He humbled himself. He touched the dirtiest part of a man's body, the foot, to take care of a physical need. Jesus is trying to help us understand the attitude that we ought to have towards service. We ought to be looking for opportunities to serve one another. We ought to be looking for uh, chances to serve here in the church, to serve out at your job, to serve in the home with your spouse and to the rest of your family. And if you do that, look at verse 17. If you know these things, happy are ye if you do them. You understand Judas never obtained happiness. He thought through riches he, could, he would be better off and he could get more. What happened at the end of his life? He repented. He's crying. He goes and literally hangs himself. He tries to give it back and reverse the deal, but it was too late. Jesus was already condemned, it says. And he sees that, and he, rich, he was guilty. Again, in verse 17, If you know these things, happy are ye if you do them. I speak not of you all. I know whom I have chosen, but the, the Scripture may be fulfilled. He that eateth bread with me hath lifted up his heel against me. Now I tell you before it come, that when it is come to pass, ye may believe that I am he. Jesus is telling the eleven here, I'm telling you that one of you is going to betray me. I'm telling you what's about to happen. And as you see it come to pass, yet another prophecy, you will continue to believe on me. And believe the words. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that receiveth whom, whomsoever I send, receiveth me. And he that receiveth me, receiveth him that sent me. The Father sent him into his own creation to die for the creatures, for us. Verse 21. When Jesus had thus said, He was troubled in spirit and testified and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you that one of you shall betray Me. Then the disciples looked one on the other, doubting of whom He spake. Now there was, leaning on Jesus' bosom, one of the disciples whom Jesus loved. This is the author of the book of John. John himself right up against Jesus, leaning in right, right next to him. 
Simon Peter, which must be close by, therefore beckoned to him that he should ask who it should be of whom he spake. He then lying on Jesus' breast saith unto him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, He it is to whom I shall give a sop when I have dipped it. Now sop, you know, you use a piece of bread to sop up the food. So he's going to take a morsel of food. He's going to sop up probably some of the juices of the meal here. He's going to hand it to somebody. That's what he's saying. When I, I shall give a sop when I have dipped it. When he had dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. What's interesting is, I mean, they must have been at such a close table. Here's John literally leaning on him. Here's Peter whispering in his ear. Jesus said, it's the guy that I give this bread to. And he reaches and hands it. So Judas was close enough that he probably heard the question in the discussion. And he hands it to Judas. I believe, that, I believe that's what angered Judas and pushed him. And he said, you know what? I've been looking for the opportunity. This is it. I'm done. Because it's this same conversation, it's the same time, they're also arguing, who's going to be the greatest in heaven? Judas being one of them. Can you imagine that? Knowing he was going to betray the Lord. Verse 27, And after the sop, Satan entered into him, then said Jesus unto him, That thou doest, do quickly. Now no man at the table knew for what intent he spake this unto him. I imagine that just angered Judas even more. Because first he says, Yeah, it's you, I know it's you. And then he's like, Oh, you're going to go betray me? Do it quickly. Like all the more, I think Judas understood that he understood what was happening. Now, no man at the table knew for what intent he spake this unto him. For some of them thought, because Judas had the bag that Jesus had said unto him, buy those things that we have need of against the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. He then, having received the sop, went immediately out, and it was night. Therefore, when he was gone out, Jesus said, now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in Him. If God be glorified in Him, God shall also glorify Him in Himself, and shall straightway glorify Him. Little children, yet a little while I am with you. Ye shall seek Me, and as I said unto the Jews, Whither I go, ye cannot come. So now I say unto you. Now remember this angered the Jews before because they were like, where's he going to go? What's he going to do? And now he's saying it to the disciples. If you remember in the beginning of the chapter, he said the hour was come that he should depart out of this world. He's already told them everything that's about to happen, but their understanding, their, their understanding was still darkened and limited because I do believe that there was still this hope, this desire that the Christ that they were sitting with would soon be exalted as a political king. I think they looked for physical glory and a political glory. I think they're thinking, listen, he's a king. He proved all these prophecies about him. He is the king, and very soon he will be the king of Jerusalem, and we will serve with him in his kingdom. And that's why Jesus even confirmed those things. Oh, there's a kingdom coming, but it's not what you think. It's not in the immediate. We're not going to read, build up these stones of this evil Jerusalem, this earthly Jerusalem. It's the heavenly Jerusalem and the kingdom to come with the Lord Christ. They didn't get that. We serve now. We rule later. That's how He works. In fact, verse 34, look at this. A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another. As I have loved you, that ye also love one another. Notice this is not really a new commandment, but he says it is. Love has always been a commandment, right? I mean, this is early on, this is one of his commandments. Love the Lord thy God, uh, love your brother, right? Now, but now, what here he's saying, that ye love one another. How, how much should I love him, Lord, as I have loved you? What a statement. Jesus takes it to another level. I've washed your feet. I've taken care of you. I've taught you. I've taken you under my wing. I've shown you amazing things from heaven. I've shown you the resurrection of the dead. I've confirmed these prophecies. And he said, I'm telling you to serve and be humble and love as I have. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. If somebody's looking for a life verse. Here's a good life verse. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, how can people know that you're a Christian if ye have love one to another? Is it because of your understanding of an end times theology? Is it because of your hate for sin and there's a place for that? Is it because you go to church? 
It's if you have love one to another. This is so important. That's what Jesus came to earth to do. He was patient and long-suffering and loving and compassionate. And He's asked us to do the same thing. He's commanded us that we ought to love the brethren. Verse 36. Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, whither goest thou? Jesus answered him, Whither I go, thou canst not follow me. Now, but thou shalt follow me afterwards. Now Jesus would die, and he would ultimately ascend. And Peter would ultimately follow in those same footsteps. Peter saith unto him, Lord, why cannot I follow thee now? I will lay my life down for thy sake. Jesus answered him, Wilt thou lay down thy life for my sake? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, the cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me thrice. When Jesus says you can't go where I'm going, part of that is that he's going to lay his life down. And I want you to understand this. There's one other big difference here. Jesus died for all. He died for our sins, didn't he? Jesus is saying, I'm going to lay my life down. He died literally for all of our sins. And yet Judas, he died for his own sins. You understand that Judas was so selfish and so greedy that he passed up his one opportunity to not die and go to hell. In Matthew 27, verse 5, It says, and he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. Right before that in verse 4 he says, saying, I have sinned in that I have betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, what is that to us? See thou to it. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. Listen, Christian, don't get greedy. Don't let pride lift you up. Don't let hate fill your heart and cause you to suffer from your own sin. Jesus is is showing us a distinction here because He wants us to follow in His footsteps. As He loved, so should we love. As Jesus walked to serve other people, to be humble instead of full of pride, to love people that are sometimes unlovable, that's our purpose. That's what a true disciple is. If you continue in My Word, then are you My disciples indeed. If you continue doing the things that I'm saying, because Jesus was still giving them more information and more information, and you know what? A lot of times they just reject it. But Lord, where's the kingdom? I want to rule with you. I want to be the ones that sits on a big throne next to you. That's what I'm looking forward to. Jesus said, I need somebody that's willing to humble themselves, not worry what other men think about you, to serve those that need to be served, to love your brothers and sisters in Christ, to lay your life down for your friends. If we could get a hold of this, then we would be true disciples indeed. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank You for Your Word. Lord, thank You for giving us a great example. Lord, I pray that You would help us to not fall as Peter did and as Judas did. Lord, I pray that You would help us to see the pride and the greed in our own life and be willing to humble ourselves and share what we have and serve others while we're here. Lord, we know we have so many great things to look forward to, we can't even comprehend it. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be filled with your Spirit and learn to walk in the Spirit for your glory. We ask this in Jesus' name.